Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, DwyerSportsBetting.com. On Roku, look us up in the sports section, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, if you want unfiltered, unbiased boxing commentary, don't listen to my comments. What I want you to do is to look at your comments, YouTube Nation, the boxing group we've put together here on my channel page. What I want everyone to do right now, if you have a moment, is to look at the comments posted to the post fight on Darren Barker's victory over champion David Gill. Right now, keep in mind, Darren Barker wins that fight, according to the judges, and took Gill's title. Now, forget what you heard in the mainstream media, right? Because here online, we're our own special group, right? People here aren't trying to cater to corporate sponsors or cable networks, right? We're boxing fans. We're not the supplier. We're the consumer here. Right now, what I want people to do is to read the comments, and I want you to think about the 12th round of that fight. Forget my earlier comments on the 11th round, right? I understand there's a lot of blowback on that. Fair enough. But the 12th round of the fight, most of you here online thought that Daniel Gill clearly won that 12th round, right? Let's just focus on the last round of the fight, right? Here online, after that fight took place, after I posted a post-fight video and commented on the 6th, the 11th, and the 12th rounds, YouTube Nation spoke about each of the rounds, in particular, the 12th round. Now, let me just say, The reports are in. We now know something I didn't know when I made the video. Going into the 12th round, the way the judges had scored that fight, the winner of the 12th round was going to be the middleweight world champion. And understand, while YouTube Nation watching that 12th round thought that Daniel Gill clearly won the 12th round. Two of the three judges gave that 12th round to Darren Barker. And believe it or not, that was the margin by which Darren Barker won the fight. Right? One judge had it even going into the last round. He gave it to Darren Barker. Had that judge given the last round to Daniel Gill, the title would not have changed hands, right? If you want literally visual proof of how close this fight was, just read the comments about that 12th round that are attached to the post-fight video. Let's switch subjects. Oh, let me just say one other thing, too. Understand, you know, really, I'm trying to spur real talk on boxing, right? This channel's really about real talk for the hardcore sports enthusiasts. I'm not expecting anyone to agree with me. I'm not above giving an opinion, even when I realize that in a room of 50 people, I might be one of 10 who hold that opinion. Feel free to disagree with any comment I make. All I ask is that after a fight, if you have, you know, a gripe or a point of view, I hope you consider stopping by my page and leaving it in the comment section, right? In the media, 
As you can imagine, there are going to be a lot of conflicting reports after a fight. But nothing is truer, in my opinion, than hearing from the boxing hardcore. Actual boxing fans, people who go online and think, hey, you know what, while I'm online, of all the possibilities in the universe, I'm going to discuss boxing, right? And all I can say is, that group saw the 12th round, folks. If you gave the champ the 12th round, quite frankly, there is no way that he should have lost his belt in a fight in which he scored the only knockdown. We can debate the 11th round. We can debate other rounds in the fight. But just understand, you know, if the fight is that close and comes down to a 12th round where most of you feel that the champion won the round, I have no idea how that champ could lose his belt. Let me also address another subcrowd. Many people felt that Darren Barker landed the harder punches. Let me just say a couple of things on that. First, you know, did I blink? Did I miss when Daniel Gill got hit with a liver shot, hit the canvas, barely beat the count, was helpless for the next 30 seconds in that fight? I didn't see Darren Barker have any moment of success in the bout like that moment. Right? Understand, we can talk about who landed the harder punches. The most effective punch in the fight was landed by Daniel Gill. Let's go one step further. I'm always amazed when one fighter is busted up. Look at his face. Right? One fighter is busted up. The other guy is relatively unmarked at the end of a fight. And then I'm to believe that the busted up guy landed the harder punches? Come on. Come on. So, I'll say this. It was a close fight. Could have gone either way. But this was a championship fight. And maybe I'm old school, but I thought if you were going to take the title, you had to clearly beat the champion. With that in mind... I don't know how the judges could look at that 12th round and have two of the three of them feel that the challenger won that round. Let me hear from you, YouTube Nation. Let's switch gears. Understand, that fight wasn't the only fight of the night. Another big fight was Sergei Kovalov taking Nathan Cleverly's light heavyweight title, right? Now, let's just put it this way. And I mentioned before the fight, I thought Kovalev had a chance to win by KO. And I mentioned, in fact, go back to June 15th. You'll see I made a Kovalev video where I pointed out that Kovalev is the real deal. I'll be blunt. If I'm Bernard Hopkins, I don't fight him. I really don't. If you think back in history, when you think about the great Joe Lewis... When you think about Lewis winning big fights over people like Max Schmeling, Billy Kahn, right? Just understand that one of the biggest chapters in the Joe Lewis book is him getting destroyed by young lion Rocky Marciano, right? Joe Lewis gets knocked out of the ring, right? Fans don't seem to really put the ages of the fighters into their memories of the fight, right? They don't put the career arc of the fighters into their memories of the fight. So, you know, I still hear from people how Lennox Lewis beat Mike Tyson, right? Forget the fact that at the time of the fight, Mike Tyson was no longer Mike Tyson and would lose badly to the Mike Tyson of 1988. Right? Well, all I'm saying is this. If I'm an esteemed member of the boxing profession, an obvious future Hall of Famer, a champion in multiple weight classes who's still able at 48 to hop in the ring with younger Lions and to hold my own at a minimum, make the fights competitive, 
at a minimum, right? If I'm Bernard Hopkins, why would I want to risk being Joe Lewis against Sergei Kovalev? Understand, you know, with Kovalev, if it goes wrong, you're going to look awfully bad, right? Kovalev isn't in there to stick a jab and outscore you for 12 rounds. No, he's in there to finish you inside of five rounds, right? And so it just doesn't add up for Bernard Hopkins, who was down. Again, Jean Pascal. I've read comments here online where people say, well, Hopkins is a great defensive fighter. I agree wholeheartedly, right? Hopkins has a great chin. I agree wholeheartedly. But understand, Hopkins' neighborhood, the place where he built his legacy, was in the middleweight division at 160, right? Now, it's a tribute to Hopkins that Hopkins is able to gain weight and be a stud at 175 pounds. But Kovalev hits hard at 175 pounds. And understand who Kovalev is, too. He's not the free swinger people think he is. He's a planned technician. He's accurate. He's not just in there trying to bum rush you and shoulder you. No, he's actually patient. He bides his time. Then he picks his spots, right? It's really a tribute to his trainer, John David Jackson, former, you know, fighter. Um, Kovalev is well-schooled in the sport. If I were advising Bernard Hopkins, I would tell him that this risk is simply too great. Let's now talk about Cleverly. Cleverly has openly told the press that he might end his career here. A word of advice to Nathan Cleverly from Just Another Boxing Hack Online. If I were you, I would step away from the sport right now. You know, boxing isn't about who's the toughest man in the room. Skills are involved. The guys who have longevity in the sport, in my opinion, have one of two things. They either have outsized punching power. For example, I think Kovalev has several years left in the sport, right? A guy like Vladimir Klitschko, a guy like Vitaly Klitschko, guys who can hit you, drop you, and finish you, right? Those guys can actually age well because even as, you know, their reflexes dim and they aren't able to react the way they did as a younger man, that punching power can literally turn around to fight in one punch. So big George Foreman was able to come back and win a belt late in life. Right? If you have punching power, then you can hang around the sport past your expiration date. The other group that actually seems to age well are the fighters with great defense. Right, If you're Evander Holofield, who has great defense, quite frankly, right? if you're Evander Holofield, if you're Floyd Mayweather, Mayweather, if he wants, has a few more years left in the sport. Bernard Hopkins, right? Great defense. Vitaly Klitschko, not just great power, but also great defense. And I'm talking about you have to be wired in a way where you're thinking defensively. So Vitaly Klitschko can drop his hands. When's the last time you saw Vitaly Klitschko with a closed eye, with welts on his face, getting hit more than once hard in a round? When's the last time, right? Rarely happens. And my point to you is 
the great defensive fighters have thought that way for years. So even as their reflexes age and aren't the reflexes of a 27-year-old, the guy in the ring just intuitively knows how to roll with punches, right? Intuitively knows to raise a hand when necessary. Intuitively knows when to back away when the action gets too hot. Now, in my opinion, Nathan Cleverly, and he's a superior athlete. Make no mistake about it, right? He's one of the better athletes in the sport of boxing. But in my opinion, Nathan Cleverly is neither a puncher, nor is he defensively gifted, right? He's a fighter. He's a guy who, if you hit him, he wants to hit you back. Now, what doesn't age well in boxing, in my opinion, is volume. You show me a high volume guy, you know, in his 20s. When he gets to his 30s, my point to you is simply that volume is going to start to dissipate, right? Nathan Cleverly, to me, is a volume guy. He outworks you. He uses his athleticism to literally outwork you, right? To throw higher volume, to get you on your back heels. He's not beating you up with punching power. He's outworking you. He's outlanding you, right? He's trading with you. He gives away his height. He sprouts roots to the canvas. He's duking it out with you. That's not the kind of style that ages well. And folks need to realize that Nathan Cleverly now would have to completely rework his game to change his style to become a defensively gifted fighter, right? That takes years. Boxing is like language. I can't wake up tomorrow and then suddenly sound like a sophisticated English professor unless I've been spending my life paying attention to vocabulary, sentence structure, uh, word choice. And so just like no one can learn eloquence in 24 hours or quite frankly in three months, the length of time for a training camp, I don't believe Nathan Cleverly is going to learn the kind of defense that quite frankly is second nature to a guy like Vitaly Klitschko. Right? Or a guy like Bernard Hopkins. Let me also point out, you saw Cleverly brutally knocked out by Kovalev. Many are wondering how the fight even continued past the round before the last round. Right? Well, understand, when you look at the great defensive fighters, they almost never get battered like that. Right? Vitaly Klitschko has been in tough fights. Has he ever been battered like that? You know, Floyd Mayweather, when we think about his tough fights, what are we talking about? The Castillo fight? The Miguel Cotto fight? Was he close to, you know, being on the canvas multiple times? Right? Bernard Hopkins, for those with long memories, they'll remember Segunder Mercado actually dropped Bernard Hopkins back in the 90s. Right? Jean Pascal recently dropped Bernard Hopkins. The point is simply this. Bernard Hopkins is so rarely on the canvas that you have to go through his record with a fine-tooth comb to come up with moments where Bernard Hopkins is on the canvas. And then when you look at some of the knockdowns, the Segundo Mercado um, you know, um, knockdowns, they look like flash knockdowns. In other words, the great defensive fighters they, they just don't get hit like Nathan Cleverly routinely gets hit. When you read that Nathan Cleverly's fight against Tony Bellew was a war, and you look at the videotape and you see Bellew landing repeated big shots, that's a bad sign when 
Nathan Cleverly is in his 20s. How's he going to clean that up and get the reflexes in the approach to be able to dodge those punches in his 30s? And so my point to Nathan Cleverly is simply this. You have money in the bank, according to reports. You were the light heavyweight champion of the world. No one can take that away from you. You need to think not about today, but about 15, 20 years from now. When you walk into a room, people are going to look at you and they're going to know that you were Nathan Cleverly, former light heavyweight champion. You reached the top floor for your division, right? The sport is dangerous. I cannot tell people how many fighters who used to give great interviews, I mean great interviews, now have slow and slurred speech patterns, right? Understand too, one of the things older people know is that as you age, the people around you change. I hope Nathan Cleverly is not relying on just the consensus of the people around him today. All I'm saying is think about the people who were around Ali in the 1970s, right? Many of those people are no longer around Muhammad Ali. So in a sport where you're risking your health, right, where great fighters now look like they're having slurred speech problems, right? They can't even interview some great fighters before fights in that great fighters division to get their point of view because some of the guys, quite frankly, just aren't able to be readily understood right in a sport where some great champions have literally just disappeared and then you start hearing about Wilfred Benitez after not having seen him in public for years in a dangerous sport if you're a fighter and you're wondering whether you should continue and you have money in the bank and you already have reached the level where people will look at you and say there's a guy who was a champion. In my opinion, at that point, especially when your style is not made to age well and you're relying on athleticism and volume that you may not have in your 30s, certainly not when compared to your younger lion opponent. In my opinion, then, it's time to walk away from the game. Let me also point out, too, that if Cleverly walks away at this point, he'll only have one loss. And of course, he'll have had a big win over Tony Bellew, right? You look on boxing telecasts and you notice they have many boxing commentators. Many of these guys held belts years ago. As you look at these guys, many young fans have no idea who these guys were. But they know that Johnny Nelson held a belt. You know, Glenn McCory held a belt. You know, someone will see Sugar Ray Leonard. Great fighter. Understand, to older people like me, when I see Ray Leonard, I'm thinking of Leonard Duran. I'm thinking of Leonard Herms. Right? I'm thinking of Leonard Hagler. Right? But understand, there's a whole newer generation who looks at Ray Leonard and all they know of Ray Leonard is Ray Leonard boxing commentator. All they know is when Ray Leonard's there, the people around him are giving him the respect and he's called a former champion, right? Nathan Cleverly, whatever happens going forward, you don't have to step back into the ring to get respect 15 years from now as a former champion. Also, boxing is a sport of changing legacies. Understand that if, as I suspect, Kovalev goes on to a few years of dominance, that's actually going to reflect as positively 
on Nathan Cleverly, right? As the fact that, well, almost as positively, as the fact that after Joe Calzaghe beat Bernard Hopkins, Hopkins went on to other big accomplishments, right? That Calzaghe victory, quite frankly, helps Calzaghe's legacy to me as much as any other fight Calzaghe had, right? After that, right? Um, you know, Vitaly Klitschko's success post Lennox Lewis has quite frankly helped Lennox Lewis's legacy, right? I understand cleverly, unlike Calzaghe and Lewis, lost his fight. The point is simply, if Kovalev goes on to be a dominant champion, people will look back on the loss and they won't hold it against you. I think the safe play for Nathan Cleverly, in fact, dare I say it, I believe it's the proper play given fight styles, is to walk away from the game right here with one loss. You don't need to get hit upside the head for a living. The problem, too, is if you continue to fight. Fans are going to want you to hop back in the ring with Kovalev. That's a nightmare. The first fight was already physically draining, right? Look around the division, too. Some of the other guys in that division are heavy punchers. Think to Voris Cloud. If I were Nathan Cleverly, I would hit the off-ramp right here. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Let's talk boxing. Thanks for stopping by.